Disrupting Japan, Episode 99. Welcome to Disrupting Japan, straight talk from Japan's most successful entrepreneurs. I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for joining me. You know, when I run startup workshops and classes on entrepreneurship, by far the most popular business model used by the students for their startup ideas are two sided marketplaces. Everybody wants to be a marketplace. And why not? There's a lot to love about being a marketplace if you can pull it off. Aspiring founders imagine themselves running a platform that matches up buyers and sellers and takes a small piece of each transaction. They imagine dozens of other ways to monetize both the relationships they have with the participants and the data and the insights they gather about the market itself. And they all scale up easily and can be run with a relatively small staff. Really, online marketplaces seem like the ideal business model. And on paper, they are. The reality, however, is that marketplace businesses are hard. I mean, really hard. Sure, once you have millions of users, marketplaces can be insanely profitable. The problem is getting that first thousand or maybe ten thousand active users. That's hard. To do that, you need to be doing something unique. Well, today we sit down with Chika Tsunoda, the CEO of Anytimes and the director of the Sharing Economy Association of Japan. And she explains how she's been building a P2P services marketplace with. A unique Japanese twist. It's been a bit of a crazy journey for Chika so far, but she thinks that Anytimes is positioned to take advantage of a unique aspect of the Japanese labor market. But you know, Chika tells that story much better than I can. So let's hear from our sponsor and get right to the interview. Some of Japan's largest companies are starting open innovation programs and actively reaching out to global startups. They're new at this, and that's where Crew, with two W's, comes in. Crew runs corporate startup accelerators for companies like Toyota and Panasonic and dozens more. And these programs are one of the best ways to jumpstart your business in Japan. Many are open to global startups, and they're completely free. Now, I've known and worked with the Crew team, and they're probably doing more than anyone to bridge the gap between corporate Japan and global startups. So, drop by crew with two W's dot M E slash four hyphen startups and get started. I am sitting here with Chika Tsunoda, the director of the Sharing Economy Association in Japan and the fearless founder of Anytimes. So, thanks for sitting down with me. Thank you for coming and thank you for interviews. Anytimes is a skill sharing and skill matching platform. But I think you can probably describe it much better than I can. And Anytime is a skill sharing platform to connect people who need help and those who want to work in the neighborhood, such as everyday household chores, pet care, assembling furniture, language lessons, and so on. Tell me a bit about your, your customers. So, who uses it? Is it、um, what are the most popular services people are sharing?、Uh, yes,、uh, most popular. Customer is housewives and university students and active seniors. So, what kind, of, what kind of skills? What are people doing? Are they putting together furniture for people? Are they、uh, cleaning homes? What, what are the services that are being offered? Most popular category is、uh, house cleaning, and next,、uh, cooking,、oh. and next, assembling furniture. But we also have other categories. So, for example, pet care, English lessons,、uh, Chinese lessons, guitar lessons. And how much does something like that cost? The price average is one hour, 2,000 yen. Okay. So, not high cost. Right, right. And the platform takes 15%? Uh, yes,、commission? yes, 50% commission is our sales revenue. Okay. How many active users do you have now? Active users is our 
secret. We, I cannot say okay. that, but I'm sorry. But our user is 30,000 users. And, and how many people do you have that are offering skills? Uh, yes, 30,000 users. Because uh, if you register any times, uh, you can be clients and supporters, both of them. But like, for example, right now today on the website, how many different offerings are there? They are also clients and supporters. Sometimes they will be clients, but sometimes they want to earn money. They will be supporters. I see. So, so the idea is really that everyone on the platform should be both buying and selling something on the platform. Ah, yes, that's right. Okay. <laughs> Thank right. you. And, and do most people do that? Are most people buying sometimes and selling sometimes? Yes. And this rate is really important. So next, our KPI is this rate. That's an, it's an interesting design for a marketplace. Most marketplaces have many, many more buyers and only a few sellers. Has it been difficult to get everyone to be a seller? Uh, yes, uh, our first KPI was seller KPI. First, we need seller, especially uh, in Japanese labor market. There is few laborers, so this is Japanese big social problems. Right. So if we get sellers, uh, this is really important thing. I would imagine most of your users are not professionals. They're just using it to earn a little bit of extra income. Is that right? We also have professional and only hobby, but the people they use as hobby, but the hobby will be work okay. and monetize. And or is it more men or more women? Is it more based in cities or in rural areas? Uh, men and female is 50-50%, so same. Mm -hmm. And the area is 70% user living in Tokyo. I guess that makes sense. It's you need a certain density of people. Yeah, yeah, yes. Before you can do this. This is very important. Right. Yes. Okay. Well, actually, before we dive into more detail about any times, I want to back up a bit and talk about you. <laughs> you graduated from Keio Law School. You worked at Nomura for a while and Cyber Agent. Yes. These are big, stable companies. What made you want to go out and start a startup? Ah, uh, yes, this is a wrong story. <laughs> and uh, when I was a little, I wanted to work about aid to developing countries. So I wanted to work in United Nations, like UNESCO, UNDP. But after graduate university, I thought I should have experience. I wanted to learn business and finance. I thought there is many social problems in Japan. But on a personal level, why did you decide instead of... There's a lot of things you could have done. You could have gone to work for an NPO like you were planning. Uh, you could have joined a division of a company that's focused on those problems. Why start a startup? In Japan, there is many social problems. I thought I should solve these problems in Japan. That's why I decided to found this company anytime. Okay. But it's, it's a big change. What did your family think of the change? Uh, actually, my parents doesn't like, didn't <laughs> like founding a company because my father was also an entrepreneur and my mom was a programmer. Okay, well, it seems like they, they would be more excited and supportive of you starting your own company. No, because my father knew about how it's hard to... He knew how much work it really yes. is. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And because he's, he was also an entrepreneur. First, he say really worried about me and my mom too. But if I decide one thing, they know I don't accept other <laughs> opinions. You're stubborn? <laughs> <laughs> That's actually very useful for a startup founder to be stubborn. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what do they think of it now? Have they, they come around and they think it's a good idea now or do they still worry about you? I think a little worried about <laughs> but 
uh, they always support me That's and good. always care about my health. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. When you were starting to put the company together, you're not a programmer or a, no. a designer yourself. No. So how did you build the team? How did you pull the team together? Uh, yes. First year, I did only me and crowdsourcing services. But uh, after one year, I started to hire people. First employee is my sister-in-law, <laughs> my brother's wife, <laughs> and then um, my other friends, my friends' friends. So just and your then, personal network. Yeah, yeah, yes. How did that work? Because I know a lot of people who are not programmers or designers, but have an idea and they want to start a startup. It seems in theory very simple to go on to Lancers or uh, Freelancer.com and say, I want this done and this done. This was really difficult because I didn't have experience of direction. So everything was my first experiences. This is difficult and very slow development. So after two years, I stopped outsourcing. And then I started to hire programmer and designer. So for someone else in your situation, someone with a good idea but who doesn't, who's not a programmer or a designer, would you recommend that they use outsourcing from the beginning or would you recommend just go out and, and hire a team at the beginning? Uh, depend on CEO, yeah. <laughs> depend on founders. If, like me, should hire programmer and designers. But if you have experiences to direction and management and development, I think uh, you should use crowdsourcing services. To keep costs down. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what happens, I like the idea of the skill sharing community, right? Where Thank everyone you. is, but building a company around that. Anytime you have a marketplace, it would seem like sometimes you're going to get people who only want to buy. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe I only need someone to look after my dog, but I don't want to sell anything. Or, yeah. or what happens with people who only want to buy? They don't want to sell anything. Ah, uh, this is okay, no problem. First, only use anytime as client, but two months later, one year later, they start to use as supporter. And, and do you know what percentage of people actually do both? 8%, 7%, oh, yet, okay. yes, yet. But uh, we are thinking about more. Let me ask you a general strategy question for these kind of marketplaces. Uh, there, there's basically two approaches, either go broad or go narrow. It seems like most marketplaces, they go very narrow. For yeah, example, yeah, yes. they're just about pet care or they're just for cleaning. The logic is usually by going very narrow, it makes it easier to advertise and it, it gets, makes it easier yeah. to brand and get attention. So what made you decide to go as a broad market instead yeah. of a very narrow market? Okay, that's why uh, we are thinking about a community platform, not only pet sitter matching service, not only house cleaning matching service, we are thinking about community platform, mm. so many kind of skills. Okay, I see. That makes sense. So the, the, the vision is not necessarily the, the transactions. The vision is building the community. Yes. All right. In Japan, the expectations of quality and customer service is really, really high. Have you had to educate your customers a little bit? Have you had any problems when people deliver a service themselves? Maybe it's not as high quality as uh, uh, pros yeah, do it? Our service has mutual reviews. reviews. So next client can see our reviews. Okay, yeah, I think in the sharing economy in general, the mutual rating system, it's at the center of the whole sharing economy. But something very interesting is been happening with ratings in, at least in the US services. Almost everyone gives five-star ratings. It's ratings yes, tend yeah. to be very, very high. Yeah. Do you see that happening? Is, do people in Japan still give very carefully considered ratings or do they tend to just be very high? Yes. 
our matching category is only uh, small things, not a uh, professional matching, not big difference. It's a person A, person B, not big difference because household chores and small things. Okay. Second point, uh, we will start alliance with more local governments and companies, and they will do review for their area users. Okay. Do you have any plans on going global? Do you think this is a model that would work in other countries? Yes, first, of, co uh, of course, first uh, we are thinking about Japanese market, but we are thinking about go abroad. So this is also difficult because Japanese labor market is really unique in the world. If we customize Japanese labor market, it's difficult to go abroad. What about the Japanese labor market makes it so unique? Most Japanese has many stereotypes. For example, big company is great. One company in the life. So if we customize to Japanese market, so... In Japan, people do tend to want to work one job for their, their whole career. It would seem that this kind of a company would be more difficult to make in Japan than overseas. Okay. Well, well let's talk about Japan in general then. Because I, I think it's very interesting how the image of freelancing has changed just in the last 10 years or so. Japan already has changed about freelance and labor market a little. But I think only little and only in Tokyo ah, and okay. center of Tokyo. So I have many work trips to many areas in Japan. But I always think this change is only Tokyo, center of Tokyo. Mm. Why do you think that is? Do you think that's cultural or just because there's so many more job openings in Tokyo? I think freelance and especially programmer and designer and writer can work from anywhere. Outside, living cost is low and they can work online. So I think so much opportunity in countryside. It seems like it, it is an opportunity. And it's been very interesting watching, like 10 years ago, politicians were saying these, these freelancers and needs are, are pu pushing the economy down and they should just get a job and help the economy. <laughs> and now everyone sort of understands that, that having these freelancers is really helpful for the economy. Yeah. Uh, especially for creation of new businesses and new business lines. So in theory, yes, there, we should see a lot of people programming and writing and, de and designing in not-so-crowded places like Tokyo. You know. In reality, is that happening? I don't know exact number, but I think still really few. Yeah? Yeah. Because uh, this is a mind. City people, especially center of Tokyo people, more international and more flexible. Countryside mind is really old, <laughs> Some, but depend on people. If city Tokyo people think about to move to countryside, really different culture. That's why it's difficult to move. Well, also I imagine most of the programmers and designers and such tend to be younger and would more likely want to live in Tokyo or maybe have recently graduated university at Tokyo or one of the other big cities in Japan. So I, I live in a bit of a bubble. So all of my friends are startup founders. I've started companies myself. And I see lots of people that are freelancing and are using sharing economy type of companies. But like I said, that's just my bubble. In, in the real Japan, what is the attitude towards the sharing economy business model, whether it's something like freelancing or house rentals, what's the average Japanese think of it? The people who have experiences to use sharing economy services are 1% in Japan. Only 1% Only 5% in Japan. But U.S., 25% or 30% people in U.S. In Japan, start to grow sharing economy market. 
So maybe same as 10 years ago, U.S. <laughs> I mean, sharing economy is such a broad term, but I, I've noticed most of the use of sharing economy is mostly like crowdsourcing. It's, it's businesses using freelancers, and we haven't seen much consumer to consumer sharing economy services yet in Japan. Yes, still there is few platform about C to C. Do you think that's just? Is there something culturally? That makes it difficult to accept, or do you think it's just a matter of time until people are exposed to it? I think we need more and more time. Just time. Just time, in five years or ten years. But after that, C to C sharing economy is same as all the Japanese help each other systems,、mm. not internet. Only help each other in their communities. Right, right. This is normal, but. Now, dilution of community, community helping is dilution. Okay, so it's not as common an attitude as it used to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you think about it, it seems like Japan would be set up very well for sharing economy companies,、um, particularly in the cities.、Uh, it's very high density of population. Apartments and houses are small, so you don't really want to you don't want to buy a lot of things. <laughs> There's a, in general, a high level of trust among the population, so it, it seems like it's it's almost ideal for consumer to consumer sharing. Yes, I, so that's why I think sharing economy system is really fit to Japanese people, but Japanese people doesn't like internet very much. Japanese people doesn't like new service, new platform. That's why it's difficult to. Penetrate this system soon, but I think this is very fit to Japanese people. Yeah. So. So it's really just a matter of time. Yes. I hope so. So looking back at it, from when you first started and you were outsourcing everything to onboarding and your fundraising and your growth, what would you do differently if you had to do it again? First, team. Yeah. Team. I think I should have in-house team as soon as possible. Okay. And if I back five years ago, <laughs> I would make development team first, and then I found company. So build the team first, <laughs> then find the yes. company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I、Absolutely. think this is important. I think so. I think that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> That's why I spend years. <laughs> But I think this is also very good experiences. Well, yeah, that's. I mean, the only way you get experience is by making mistakes. Yeah, yes. I think mistakes equal experiences. So I think this is very good. You know, in another interview you gave, you mentioned that government regulations were one of the biggest、ah, yes. challenges for starting a new company. What sort of regulations? Exact regulation we don't have it,、mm. but、uh, so for example, car regulation and minpaku regulations. Oh, I see. So not regulations about startups, but regulations about specific industries. Ah,、uh, yes. Makes it hard to innovate. Innovate. Yes, yes. Especially houses and car and、uh, elderly care, child care. So many regulations, many rules. So difficult to innovate. All、oh, right. And even if tourist, if I wanna guide to foreigner friends, I need. You need a special license. Special license, but this regulation has changed. So you think that Japan it's getting more relaxed with the regulation now? I think so too. Like, yeah. Slowly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> slowly, but this is big change in Japan. Okay. Well, listen. Before we wrap up, I want to ask you what I call my magic wand question, and that is, if I gave you a magic wand,、yeah. and I told you you could change one thing about Japan, anything at all, the education system, the legal system, the way people think about taking risks, anything at all, to make it better for startups in Japan, what would you change? Education. Education. Yes. What would you change about it? 
currently, Japanese education system is very strict and no flexibility. I think flexibility is really important to innovate. So with flexibility, you mean, yeah, so for example, this week, every Japanese third grader is learning exactly the same history lesson as every other Japanese third grader. Yeah, yes. And the same textbook, and same teaching, and same content. Do you think we need to change the content of the education, or do you think we need to change the method, uh, how children are taught? I view people should have options how to live, how to work. This is important. And then they can choose many work and lifestyles. So by nature of the education system being so strict, it makes people not realize that there are flexible options for life. Yes. So how can you teach that kind of creativity? What would you do? Oh, it's difficult. I'm not a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> but I think our first textbook, all Japanese students use the same textbook. Depends on schools, I think children can use different textbook. I think they should have options. But you know, even if, even if they let different cities choose textbooks, yeah. Japanese people would experience more differing opinions when they talk to other people. Yes, and then I think not only textbook, they should have experiences about work and about agriculture, about, I don't know, <laughs> but many things. Ah, so more, more hands-on yes, approach? Yes, more hand, hands-on approach. Not only textbook, Japanese education system is only, only on the desk. Yeah, it's very abstract. That's really true. Even all the way up through university, yeah. there's a lot of business professors who've never run a business and, and computer science professors who've never had to write software commercially. <laughs> so it's a level of abstraction. That's the, actually the opposite of startups where we need people to like just do things. Yes, I think our Japanese people need more creativity and flexibility. So, for example, Japanese exam, only memorize. Right. If, if I memorize, always 100. And for example, I was really good about English, but only writing and only reading. I have met several English teachers who could not speak English. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, my teacher couldn't speak English, but only reading and writing and difficult words. <laughs> but I cannot speak English, so this is the result. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're doing fine. Um, but do you think that's changing? Because in the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen so many more Japanese entrepreneurs. Do you think the education system is changing? Or why do you think we're seeing so many startups now? Ah, yes, this is two points. First, Japanese education has changing a little. Okay. <laughs> yes, this is very good thing. And second, uh, this is internet. Internet technology effects is really big so for they, children. So they can study themselves. And yeah, yeah, yes. Oh. Okay. My entrepreneur friends studied internet and programming by their selves. Okay, so it is, it is starting to change. Yes. I think this is a very good thing, not, not only bad things. Right, right, right. It, you don't have to change the education system. People can find out on their own now. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, Chika, thanks so much for sitting down with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Your journey to success in Japan will involve some twists and turns. In trying to navigate new terrain, planning the safest, most effective way through on your own can be overwhelming. The Carter Group have been using market intelligence and research to guide Japan entrants for decades. They've honed an agile, cost-effective, but consultative approach that will help you find the perfect product market fit, explore user and consumer dynamics, and act as an honest broker to let you know the reputation and track record of potential partners here in Japan. And when you're ready to go, 
Their executive search team can also help you hire the right people to drive your business forward. So if you haven't got Japan completely figured out yet, the Carter Group can help you out. And we're back. You know, I'm a developer. And all of my startups I've started by programming up a barely functional prototype and getting customer feedback, and maybe even a few sales, before going into development. I have some designer friends who operate pretty much the same way, by creating stunning mock-ups that wow potential customers. Most founders without development or design skills usually seek out a founder that has them. Chica, however, walked a very different path. Lacking programming and design skills, she simply outsourced both of these functions. That almost always ends in disaster. But to her credit, Chica managed to pull it off, and over a three-year period pulled all the programming and design in-house. She admits she would never do it that way again, but she deserves props for making it work. The bigger question around any times, and really around the sharing economy in Japan in general, is a matter of customer acquisition. As Chika pointed out, less than 1% of Japanese have ever used a sharing economy product or service, and many Japanese are still unfamiliar with the basic concept. And yet, Japanese cities seem like the perfect place for sharing economies to thrive. There is a high population density, so people are close. Houses are small, so being able to borrow rather than to buy things is a huge advantage. And although this is really hard to quantify, there is a high level of trust in Japanese society. The respect for other people and their property is almost unequaled around the world. And yet, the sharing economy has not really taken root here. I think it will. It might just take time, or there might be a triggering event or a hitting of critical mass, or we might just be waiting for that killer app. But sooner or later, we're going to see the sharing economy flourishing in Japan. If you've got thoughts on the sharing economy, Chika and I would love to hear from you. So come by disruptingjapan.com slash show 099 and tell us about it. And hey, guess what? Our big third anniversary live podcast is coming up on September 19th. It'll be at Super Deluxe in Rapungi, And we've got a panel of some amazing Japanese startup CEOs and it's going to be a great time to have a few beers and talk with everyone who's anyone in Tokyo's startup community. I can't really believe that it's been almost three years. I mean, sometimes it seems like I just started disrupting Japan a few months ago. And sometimes I feel like I've been doing this show forever. But I love doing it. And I love talking with you about Japanese startups. So if you get the chance... Come out and have a drink at our third anniversary show, and let's talk there. The details are at the site, disruptingjapan.com. But most of all, thanks for listening. And thank you for letting people interested in Japanese startups know about the show. I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for listening to Disrupting Japan.